Yes, absolutely. This is the first um, diagnosis of death that I have ever seen, particularly of our Lord. And of course, we know he died on the cross. Um, typically, we think of, of asphyxiation. But what Dr. Serafinia diagnoses him with is... Here we go. Welcome to a special edition of the Focusing Way podcast. I'm your host, Davide Battistella. We call these special episodes, The Way is Love. Find The Focusing Way on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our website, thefocusingway.com. We hear so much about the heart. Phrases like heartfelt, let's get to the heart of the matter, are spoken so often that their meaning can become watered down through overuse. Today, we're taking a look at a fascinating book written by Italian cardiologist Dr. Franco Serafini, a Catholic who became interested in the growing numbers of Eucharistic miracles in the world, where the principal claim was that the Catholic hosts around the world were miraculously being converted into heart tissue. Dr. Serafini, a scientist, wanted to examine this phenomenon further, and in an impeccably presented and researched volume, takes the reader through the mystery being presented in many cities in the world. He wasn't on a mission to prove something, but to discover something. Joining me now to talk about the English translation of the book is Kristen Van Uden from the Sophia Institute Press. And joining me now is Kristen Van Uden from the Sophia Institute Press. Kristen, welcome to the podcast today. Hi, David. It's wonderful to be here. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year. This is our first episode of the New Year, one I'm very excited about, uh, because as I went through this book, I I just have to say it was a jaw-dropping experience. I just went, what? What? Really? Why don't mo- more people know about this? Or, And the beauty of it also is that it, there's so much science behind it, you know, and the volume is impeccably presented and scientifically researched and you know we're not really talking about old wives tales when we're talking about this book we're talking about well-researched investigated and documented science when it comes to the miracles associated with uh, the holy eucharist and um you know so just to start uh, just so people have a clear understanding could you just give us an overview of who Dr. Serafini is, who is this Italian doctor that dove into this study and just tell us about him. Sure. So Dr. Franco Serafini is a practicing cardiologist and a practicing Catholic, which he's very open about from Bologna, Italy, where he's practiced for decades. Um, Within the past several years, he has discovered Eucharistic miracles that are contemporary, that are of the 21st century. And with his expertise as a cardiologist, decided to do his own personal research into five of these. Um, And he actually looked into more than that, but chose these five because they have the most robust evidence. He has made several or participated in several documentaries about Eucharistic miracles that are available in Italian. And there's one in Polish um, because two of the miracles he covers occurred in Poland. And he's a traveling speaker throughout Italy. He's sort of devoted uh, the second half of his career to applying his expertise to proof of the real presence and uniting Um, both his vocation with a big V and his vocation as a cardiologist um, into into one project. Could you just give us sort of an overview of what the Catholic teaching is on the Eucharist and what is a Eucharistic miracle? Sure. So, of course, as Catholics, we believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity within the Eucharist, within the host. So we believe that at the moment of consecration, when the priest pronounces the words over the materials of bread and wine, that they are substantially changed into our Lord. So really, in reality, every time the Eucharist is confected, that is a miracle. And that is something that our Lord has made a physical sign of himself in order to intimately unite himself to us here with our physical bodies. When we talk about a Eucharistic miracle, What we mean is that that veil of appearance of bread and wine is basically taken away. So instead of still receiving under the appearance of bread and wine, we actually see what we know to be there, which is the body and blood and soul and divinity of our Lord. So in each of these cases, uh, Eucharistic miracles have occurred throughout time immemorial, really from the beginning of the church. 
Um, there were many within the medieval period, and then somewhat surprisingly, a plethora even here in the 21st century. In each of these cases, what is observable both to the naked eye and then under scientific investigation is heart tissue of our Lord um, with many characteristics that we can discuss in more depth. And the veil, again, is torn between um, our perception and the reality that we know to be there. And it's an outward sign that um, I believe our Lord is giving us in order to bolster faith in, in the modern era. Yeah, there there are many moments uh, as we go through the book where, um, as you're reading, what is discovered is uh, uh, our Lord, you know, presents himself to people who are uh, more than one occasion uh, doubting or um, uh, the, it seems he's presenting himself to people who need to see him in, or some sign of him in some way. And, you know, that... Uh, just maybe you could get into the different ways um, the Eucharistic miracle is prompted as we go throughout the book. Yes. So historically, Eucharistic miracles have either been prompted by great faith among the people or more often great doubt. Um, one of the first recorded Eucharistic miracles was in Lanciano, Italy in the 8th century. And Dr. Serafini in this book actually covers that miracle because the evidence still remains. Um, the physical evidence of the miracle was one that he observed um, under the microscope, you know, centuries later. But this miracle occurred because the priest himself was doubting the real presence. So at the moment of consecration, he had that doubt within his heart, which his intention was there, but he, he was having a hard time believing himself. And so at that moment, that is when the host appeared as a bleeding piece of flesh. So typically we see these prompted by doubt. Of course, the gospels tell us, blessed are they who have not seen, but yet believed. And, you know, we all know, uh, we don't want to be doubting Thomas. We all know that we must believe simply because our Lord told us he said so. And that's why, but um, our Lord, I think recognizes that it is a it is a very radical um, truth to accept. Um, even in the Gospels, we see that many of Jesus' disciples left him over the teaching of the Eucharist. And I think it's theorized that even Judas Iscariot, this was one of the first moments where he began to doubt Christ, is because of just this, this absolutely radical sounding um, sacrament that we that we must imbibe and eat our Lord's body and blood. So um, in the modern era, the way we see this doubt reflected is often in terms of sacrilege or neglect of the Eucharist. So, of course, um, during the distribution of communion, there's always you know room for error, especially since communion on the hand was introduced um, in the mid 20th century. And so in each of these contemporary cases that Dr. Serafini covers, the five cases um, since 1992 from 2013, each of these Eucharistic miracles was preceded by an event of sacrilege. So not to place blame on the priest or anything, but objectively, in these cases, the host was discovered after the mass, either on the floor or in a pew or somewhere just strewn about the church. Um, in one case in the 1990s in Buenos Aires, the host was actually found in a candlestick, and it was unclear how long it had been there. It could have been years. It could have been that day. Um and so we see with, with this happening um, more and more often that it's almost as if our Lord is saying, I'm still here um, and just having to prove his presence in that way. Yeah, and it's incredible because there is a very prescribed thing that has to happen when uh, a host like that is found um, mm -hmm. or discovered. And, uh, you know, and one of the things I learned in the book uh, is that every... Um, consecrated church has a specific um, place where water goes that mm -hmm. goes directly into the consecrated ground and not into the main water supply. So mm -hmm. uh, when anything involving holy water or anything involving a miracle uh, like this, uh, the, but, but could you just describe what has to happen? Because there's different things, uh, the, because essentially the, the, the consecrated uh, the the ordained priest um, understands exactly what has to be done when mm -hmm. uh, some sacrilege occurs to the Holy Eucharist. Could you maybe describe one one or That's more right. of ways? Yeah, yeah. So that process was um, codified 
uh, by John the 23rd actually. And, but it has been similar throughout history. And so if the host is immediately dropped, of course the priest will consume right there and then. But if it is found after the fact, like in each of these cases, the process is to take the host and place it in water and then lock it in the tabernacle until it has dissolved completely. So at that point, the real presence would have basically a, no, no longer be there. Um, after that, once it's dissolved, which usually takes about two to three days, um, the remaining water is poured into what's known as the sacrarium. So that is a sink um, in which the priest disposes of, you know, maybe remnants after after mass, um, after the consecration, usually, and holy water, like you mentioned, and that goes into sacred ground in the earth. So it is the most reverent possible way to dispose of, of you know, um, divine items like this. So in each of these cases, almost across the board, and this is fascinating that it almost followed a textbook process in each of these miracles, the priest followed that procedure, uh, regardless of how long the host had been on the ground, placed it in the water, locked it in the tabernacle. And then the very next morning, in each case, when the priest brought it out, the host had not dissolved, but in fact was covered with what appeared to be red blood clots. And at that point, each priest knew that he was dealing with something out of the ordinary and at that point was forwarded on for medical investigation. Yeah, and it's so fascinating because in the past, one could say, oh, that was placed there or... um you know, there could be any number of things that are brought into it. But what's interesting is so many of these miracles are happening now in the 21st century that they can actually be scientifically proven, which is what mm. the whole book is about, uh, that these miracles are being now with the tools of modern science uh, proven to be um, what we're discovering is uh, what it starts to emerge um, is is a particular blood type and mm -hmm. um, a particular part of the heart and heart tissue. Uh, so, and, and many times also, I'm sorry, the book goes on to talk about where these things are done blindly, where the mm -hmm. scientists examining the sample don't know that it is what it is and come uh, with the conclusion of what it actually is. Um, so I don't know, maybe, could you talk maybe a bit about how many more have happened in the 21st century and how that is starting to um, have an impact on uh, not only the the occurrence, but the, the data that's coming out of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting way to approach it is through um, a convergence of data points because these miracles were all so far flung and remote from one another in space and time, but also had very consistent results. Um, and just uh, Dr. Serafini approaches this from a very skeptical stance, which is helpful um, to not go in with any confirmation bias. But one of the things that really um, drives home the authenticity is the fact that in over 50% of these cases, the scientific teams that did the investigations were secular. So they were not Catholic, not associated with Catholic institutions. Um, and they also, in about just under half, were blind studies. So they did not know what they were looking at at all. Um, they just had no idea as to the origin of the sample. And they were just going purely based on what they saw with their with their own eyes and their own tools. Um, when we talk about the heart tissue that was observed, they right under the microscope, it's quite obvious that it's heart tissue because it's a very distinct looking tissue in the body. Um, there are three types of muscle in the body. So skeletal muscle that we use to move, uh, smooth muscle, which makes up the digestive tract, and then heart tissue, which is its own particular type of muscle. Um, it's striated, it's bifurcated, it has centrally located nuclei. And uh, what I really like about this book is that there are photographs of the heart tissue where even if you can remember from high school biology, you'd be able to say right off the bat, yes, that is heart tissue. Um, <clears throat> in each of these cases, all five of them, we find that the heart tissue is alive. Um, so in Buenos Aires, the heart tissue was actually observed to be beating rhythmically, like a beating heart would be. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, in the Lanciano sample left over from the eighth century, what was found was an entire cross section of the heart. So not only was the myocardial fiber um, observable, but also 
the arterial and venous blood vessels in cross section, the vagus nerve, and some of the endothelial lining, which is the inner lining to the inside of the heart. So when it really, when you think about the theological impact of this, it makes sense that the entire sacred heart essentially would be present here. Um, when, when you're thinking of the entirety of our Lord sort of in synecdoche in smaller and a smaller representation, um, I can go into a little bit of some of the medical conditions that these teams diagnosed the heart. Yeah. And uh, we we know that uh, our Lord suffered a violent uh, death, and um, so in uh, in one of the accounts, you know, I was reading about how it sort of th- their findings confirmed that that not only that it was a specific part of the heart tissue, um, but that it was also obvious that this tissue had been under great duress and they could say mm-hmm. uh the i think the 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 medical doctor i think who was out of boston i'm just going by memory mentioned that he'd only seen this kind of thing in you know car accidents or people who had been beaten about the chest mm-hmm. before they their passing can so maybe yeah go go for it on that yeah it's really fascinating because even within these small samples we see evidence of almost the entire passion as we know it from the gospel accounts so the first thing if we if we just go in order of what our lord experienced of course first was the agony in the garden where we know that he suffered such intense spiritual and emotional distress that he was sweating blood at one point um Evidence, even of that, even after everything else he went through, was still available in this heart tissue. Dr. Serafini diagnoses him with uh, a condition that goes by its Japanese name. It's called takotsubo. And what it literally means is a pot for trapping an octopus. And it's named that way over um, because of the shape of this pot, because the heart resembles this pot when it goes into this condition. It mimics the signs of a heart attack, but it is not characterized by actual blocking of the arteries. So it's not a heart attack. It's almost a psychosomatic heart attack. Um, The bottom of the heart becomes enlarged and then the top is constricted so that it cannot pump blood properly. So if left untreated, like it it can be fatal. Um, It was only isolated really in the 1980s, this particular condition. And it was found... um, mainly in women who were experiencing emotional distress. And so this, even the beginning of, of course, he went through emotional distress the entire time, but that is still, the scars are there. Um, Of course, we know that our Lord, as he is risen, he is no longer suffering, but he still bears his wounds. And so we see even the earliest one. Um, Back to the physical trauma, the, um, the main presence that really, substantiates this is the diagnosis of what's known as necrosis in each of these samples. And that basically just means cell death. And it is a result of blunt trauma to the area. Um, So we know, of course, during the scourging, our Lord would have been beaten all throughout his body, especially around the chest area. And then also as he was carrying the cross, we know he fell at least three times And holding the cross would have been unable to break his fall. So that's another indication of blunt trauma to the chest area. Um, In addition to that, there is also evidence of stress-induced cardiomyopathy, which can be mass death of heart tissue, not necessarily due to blunt trauma, but just massive trauma shock to the entire system, which of course he would have went through after such massive blood loss and, and continued trauma. It's just so incredible that all this time has gone by and science is now able to just take, we can put the parallel between what we've read about and, and the true suffering we've read about in, um, in, the, in the gospel. And we can attach that to science, which our, our Lord is permitting us to see through these miracles. Mm-hmm. And um, just maybe let's get into a little bit about how you know, there's been other artifacts like the Shroud of Turin um, a- that have been examined or burial cloths. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how does Dr. C- Dr. Serafini's evidence compare when you're taking, you know, those, like what they've gotten out of those samples and what they're now 
I mean, they're getting blood. Not enough to get DNA, though, really, right? Not enough to get a full DNA profile, but what's found in terms of DNA in these Eucharistic miracles is consistent with um, what is found on the shroud. I know the shroud's DNA has undergone much more intensive testing, but yeah, the DNA profile of these miracles is consistent with a man living in the region of Palestine during the time we know our Lord was alive. So that basically is checks out. Um, but Dr. Serafini actually has an interesting theory as to why the DNA was incomplete. And it goes back to what you were saying about what our Lord is allowing us to see in order to, to build our faith and what we, what he has decided to reveal. Um, the doctor's theory is that in our Lord's body, of course, after he is risen, uh, he is in his glorified body as was prefigured at the transfiguration. And at that time would have no need for any sort of extra um, chromosomes in the body. And I did not know this, but apparently most of our DNA is what's called junk DNA. So there are STRs that just repeat again and again and again. You'll see if anyone ever does um, the ancestry DNA, you'll see GATA, for example, over and over. This does not code for anything biologically. So it exists and it's helpful in order to identify individuals for either forensic DNA purposes or the ancestry DNA, but it has no actual purpose in the body. And so since this is about 75% of our DNA, Dr. Serafini hypothesizes that our Lord's glorified body just simply would not have that. And that is what each of our resurrected bodies would also reflect. Um, of course, there's also the theory that our Lord is hiding himself um, just for reasons of, if you think about, what the modern world would do with the DNA of Jesus Christ, with everything with cloning and, <laughs> and all these medical ethics uh, questions. It's, it's kind of a blessing that we don't have that full profile so we can rest easy about that. <laughs> we do. That's right. And this is actually one of the most shocking consistencies with the Shroud of Turin is that blood type AB was found in each of these miracles and on the Shroud. Um, blood type AB is the most rare and it's the universal receiver. And in one of the cases that was examined in this book, um, the Mexico Eucharistic miracle from 2006, they further identified the blood type to be ABRH negative. So blood type AB is only about one to 5% of the population with that additional caveat, it's only 0.75% of the population. And so that's another just you know, evidence against skeptics with, with each of these occurrences. Blood type AB, when we think about the theological implications of this, when, when you just think of what the blood type of Jesus would be, the first thing that would come to mind, or at least it did for me, was O, right? The universal donor, because he shed his blood for all. But that's not what we see. We see the universal receiver instead, and Dr. Serafini's theory about this is really quite beautiful. And he says that since Christ has the universal receiver blood type, that is consistent with what we know, that our blood dissolves within the precious blood, that we come to him and he receives us and he washes us with his blood. Um, it was the last blood type really to develop there. It um, scientifically encompasses all the other blood types, which of course we know from Catholic theology, if you think of John Duns Scotus, his theory that Christ recapitulates within himself all of creation. Um, he is the pinnacle of, of, um, of existence. Um, so it really makes sense theologically when you think of it that way, that um, the just the narrative of the passion is really obvious, even from such a small detail as his blood type. Yeah, it's as you you know as you get through this book and and um you're just reading about this stuff it's it's uh just confirmation scientifically that it's so clear and the arguments are presented so well and scientifically that there's just no doubt um but just can you talk about a bit a little bit about how people would still think this could be faked and you know why that you know, why this book shows that this, that's not the case. Right. Yes. It's of course, always, there are going to be skeptics, um, even when the evidence is presented right in front of them. Um, of course, the first kind of line of defense was 
for people when they witnessed the miracle to say, oh, that's just red algae growing on the Eucharist or something like that. But that was sort of put to rest immediately when it was put under the microscope because that was that was no longer tenable because it was very clearly heart tissue. Uh, one of the most interesting cases of skepticism that Dr. Serafini covers is from Poland, from the Sokolka miracle of 2008. And what's funny about this is that uh, this organization called the Polish Rationalists Association, which is basically an atheist humanist uh, organization, brought charges against uh, the local church because they recognized that this was heart tissue, but it could not be that of our Lord because that's just crazy in their worldview. So they said, oh, it must have been taken from a body or taken from a human being somewhere. And if that's true, then somebody has been murdered. <laughs> that was their line of reasoning. Um, and the prosecutor actually, or excuse me, the attorney general just dismissed it um, without even taking it to court because no one had been reported missing in the area. And uh, the scientists who examined these samples said that it would have been impossible for this heart tissue to have survived in such good condition for so long um, if that were the case. So Dr. Serafini actually makes the case that it would have been more of a miracle to fake one of these Eucharistic miracles than to actually just accept what we're seeing, uh, because especially in the one of the Buenos Aires instances, that um, Eucharistic sample was kept for three years in a vial of water before they commenced the investigation. So basically it would have been impossible to not dissolve under ordinary circumstances. Um, and then to keep it alive for that long as well, without any sort of preservatives, there were no, because they did chemical analysis, of course, as well. And even things such as adrenaline um, due to the, to the trauma and to the, just the, uh, what our Lord was experiencing was there, but no preservatives were found at all. Right. And sometimes there's even white blood cells, which should be gone yes. within like, a, you know, one day. at the Exactly. After death, those would be gone. I'm glad you bring those up because that is some of the greatest evidence for the connection of uh, what we find in the Eucharist to mm -hmm. our Lord's greater mystical body. Um, because as the doctor explains, white blood cells are not produced in the heart. They're produced in the bone marrow, and then they travel throughout the body, throughout the vascular and lymphatic systems. So they're sort of the EMTs of the body. They rush to sites of trauma to repair damage. The fact that they were here in the heart tissue and in the blood alive and doing their jobs, there's actually a recorded instance where I wish I could share photographs. Um, they caught a macrophage, which is a certain type of white blood cell responsible for basically eating dead tissue in the act of consuming tissue um, and chemically dissolving it. So that was days after the Eucharistic miracle occurred and it was still alive and the body was going through the processes that it does uh, during, during life. Um, so the fact that these were present in the heart indicates that this tissue was connected to a larger living body, which is just inexplicable to, to the modern consciousness. Yes. <laughs> any cardiologist or any doctor worth the salt who would witness mm -hmm. this would say this is miraculous. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, incredible. Um, so much to go into. We've, we've already sort of uh, touched on so many things. But I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk to us about how because of this data that we have now, because of everything that's collected around this, Dr. Serafini is able to come to some sort of a, a conclusion about how our Lord died. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe this is the first time anyone has scientifically been able to give a kind of a cause. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. This is the first um, diagnosis of death that I have ever seen, particularly of our Lord. And of course, we know he died on the cross. Um, typically, we think of, of asphyxiation. But what Dr. Serafini diagnoses him with is a condition called cardiac tamponade. And what that means is that the pericardial sac surrounding the heart was engulfed with blood from a ruptured heart and could that constricted the heart's ability to pump blood. And that is the final cause of death. So when we think of he died of love, really, um, we see that evidenced. That's actually just making me emotional, as you. Say. I know. 
you have to have a box of tissues reading this book, really. <laughs> uh, there's a kind of a truth that comes through it all. And um, oh, I just, I, I, I just, yeah. I know. I think it's uh, such a timely reminder, especially as we approach Lent. I think I might reread it on Good Friday. But I think for me, at least, it has really just increased my devotion to the Eucharist. And um, I think it was St. Maximilian Kolbe who said that if angels could be jealous of humans, it would be because of the Eucharist that we receive physically into ourselves, um, our Lord in this inc- incredibly intimate way. Um, and just kind of a, a clarion call to reverence to the Eucharist, increased Eucharistic adoration and worthily receiving. Wow. This has been so lovely, so fruitful, and I'm sure our listeners will appreciate it very much. I just want to thank you for taking the time speaking with me today. Absolutely, David. Thank you for having me. Find The Focusing Way on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our website, thefocusingway.com.